Good afternoon, everybody. It's one o'clock, and uh, let's begin. This is the meeting of the dog and about the dogs. And the other thing that I would like to point out, we'd like to take down all of your names so that everybody can get a special act award. Given the number of meetings CDC has held today, this is an absolute record, 917. You all deserve special credit for coming today. Thank you. In addition to talking about dogs, this is really an event that is going to focus on interaction of people, animals, and their environment. And you will hear from our speakers a lot more about this. I'd like to welcome those who are on internal and external viewers and welcome them to our public health grand rounds. I would like to remind you that we are tracking the number of viewers. And even though it seems like we're patting ourselves on the back, it seems like a relatively good number. We are getting several thousand people every time viewing us outside of, um, outside of the auditorium and our colleagues on the Envision land. We're not necessarily doing as spectacularly well on YouTube, but then the topics are not exactly geared toward the YouTube audience, but I think we're still doing quite well. I would like to remind you and mention one new piece of information that I may not have mentioned before. All of you who want to get continuing education credits for these events, you need to use the code PHGR, Public Health Grand Rounds 10, and it's always going to be the same code just to make sure that you can uh, get the credit for attending. I would like to thank two of our colleagues who have provided selection for our science clips this month. Uh, and as you will see, there is a whole bunch of topics covered under the rabies section from vaccine, rabies in Latin America, and so on. The very same topics we're going to be discussing today. I'd also like to point out that we have now published four MMWR um, pieces on some of our topics, and we will continue to do so. Uh, some of the upcoming topics, I, I'm sure you will find them just as interesting as we have had the ones before, and to keep you interested in coming and attending, this is a list of those that are going to be, some of those that we are working on for the next several months. So, as I mentioned, this is all of these events are really a true team effort and require a lot of preparation, coordination, and rehearsals. And I really want to say that uh, this was an unbelievably wonderful group of colleagues to work with. And, and I'm always humbled with all these you know, world-known experts come here and, and really work with us in such a wonderful cooperative and, uh, spirit. I really want to point out how wonderful it was to work with them and Charles. So the speakers today are Charles Ruprecht, our own Charles, Dennis Slade for USDA, uh, Fernando Leanes from PAHO, and Debbie Briggs from uh, Global Alliance for Rabies uh, Control. And just to say a couple of words about them, and this is a very passionate group of people, not to mention that we have somebody from Latin America, and I was hoping this was going to be the most passionate event we've had ever. And so I Googled him a little bit, and you will see that he actually has his own academy of Nacional del Tango. And he let us know yesterday that he's a you know, really tango fan and dancer. So I have uh, seen that he and Debbie have actually been practicing for this event. Uh, not to say that Charles and Dennis are any less passionate in cheering them. And, and being on their side. So you're in for a really special treat, and that treat includes a couple of comments from our director. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for being here, and thanks to our speakers for their work putting this together. Rabies is a neglected disease. 55,000 people around the world estimated to die each year uh, from really a terrible disease and one that has implications not just for human health and animal health but also for kind of societal well-being and economic stability. Uh, as a former health commissioner I can tell you that rabies is one of those things that you take really seriously and that's complicated and difficult and challenging 
Uh, I remember well uh, one of our exposures where we had uh, a box of kittens had been left out for people to take and uh, had been brought back by a couple of individuals who were involved in the illicit drug use uh, industry, but also had happened to bring these kittens back and they were rabid. And finding people who had had interaction with people who were selling drugs and may have pet uh, rabid kittens provided a particularly challenging uh, investigation for a local health department. And I think many of us deal with the challenges uh, of the real world and rabies is as real world as it gets. It's also as one world as it gets because it really does highlight the interactions between human and animal health, the changes in our environment and how that is reintroducing species into some areas or increasing species in some areas. So there's a, a, a lot of both uh, consistency and evolution in the work of rabies prevention and control. Going back to the first rabies vaccine, uh, which would never have gotten through an IRB today, but saved a child's life. Um, there is real progress possible in rabies through education, through quarantine, through uh, injectable vaccination programs and oral vaccination programs and uh, animal contraception and uh, animal population control. All of these are possible. Uh, there has been success. There are some areas where there's been some falling back, but I think it's an area where we can both um, celebrate the success till now and recognize how much more progress is both necessary and possible. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Charles Ruprecht, and we thank you for the opportunity to share some of our thoughts about this high-consequence pathogens. Many misconceptions, probably based upon naivete, is that this disease of nature is rare and that there's little to nothing that we can do about it, both of which could not be further from the truth. By and large, with rare exceptions, if you develop clinical signs, you die one of the highest case fatality rates of any conventional agent, and obviously because of its impact on both human and veterinary public health, a global problem, distributed everywhere with the exception of Antarctica, and one of the oldest described diseases, in fact, every major civilization, that from the Babylonians to the present time, describes something akin, at least based upon their syndromic suggestions, the bite from an animal, suggestive of rabies. These are highly variable agents in the family Rhabdoviridae, bullet-shaped viruses, at least a dozen species that cause this disease, and antigenic variation in some of them give us pause to concern because of the lack of cross-reactivity of any veterinary or human biologics in the world. Additional pathogen discovery is expected over the rest of this century. All mammals are susceptible, but variants are adapted particularly to carnivores and to bats. The quintessential neurotropic agent after transmission, primarily by a bite, but also through inhalation or when the donor is not suspected through transplantation. The virus enters from the periphery, replicates into the central nervous system, and then is found in just about every innervated organ as well as the exit portals, the saliva. Hence, intervention needs to be prompt and practical and proper, timely based upon local events, while the virus is still in the periphery. And hence, rabies immune globulin and wound care, washing with soap and water, serve to inactivate prior to active immunity from multiple doses of vaccine over the first two-week time. Otherwise, once the virus gains access to the CNS, death is all but inevitable. Incubation period is quite variable from days to years, on average four to six weeks, very nonspecific prodromal stage. The acute neurologic has some of the hallmarks, hydrophobia and aerophobia, as we've heard classically 
throughout the ages. Shortly thereafter, the patient lapses into a coma, and with the exception of one historical survivor without any prior vaccination, death results a few days later. A relatively easy disease to diagnose if you have a history of exposure to a rabbit animal and these classical clinical signs. Lacking it, it can be a challenge. Laboratory diagnosis, the gold standard is the direct fluorescent antibody test, standardized as a national protocol here at CDC in the year 2000, with regular training provided through the National Laboratory Training Network. In humans, when an exposure is not thought, anti-mortem diagnosis can be quite challenging based upon the detection of rabies virus antigens, antibodies, or amplicons in material received before death. Tens of millions of exposures and tens of thousands of human cases. In fact, since we've just began, at least one child has succumbed to the disease, most of these occurring, unfortunately, in developing countries of Africa and Asia, with the domestic dogs still as the major reservoir throughout the world and where it has been controlled wildlife serving as important. For example, in the United States, exposures are not uncommon. It's in our backyard, it's in our houses sometimes in terms of these reservoirs. 20 to 40,000 people exposed per year, resulting in one to eight cases of human rabies annually. There's just as much rabies now as when I was a child, it's just different. Now it's in wildlife. When I was a child, we still had dogs as our major reservoir. Today we are talking about raccoons and skunks and foxes and mongoose distributed in every state but Hawaii. We know this because of decentralized surveillance, more than 100 laboratories and more than 100,000 suspect animals examined locally every year. Why focus on dogs? Because most of our exposures are due to dogs, most of our cases are due to dogs, because of the important public health role of animals such as dogs invited into our homes over the last few millennia. As many as 1% estimates of emergency room visits being due to animal bites or pediatric hospitalizations. Obviously, unmanaged dog populations are obstacles to success in developed countries such as the United States, where dog rabies transmission has been interrupted and that particular virus has been extirpated. Oral vaccination may offer one potential source of management over time. Regardless, the focus is upon induced herd immunity Vaccinate dogs, whether in a developed or developing country, and human cases fall. Focus upon animals for diagnosis and animals for control, and the human health benefits are obvious. Hence, herd immunity and vaccination in mass, minimization through health education of human exposures when exposures do occur, prompt wound care, infiltration of immune globulin, and cell culture vaccination are all but assured survivorship after such exposures. And obviously, after maintaining control, and in some places, rabies-free status, vigilance to maintain your rabies-free status, as well as to affect prompt control when it does enter. The panel of speakers today will emphasize some of these topics, such as Dr. Slate, how do we counter the emergence of these RNA viruses from wildlife to domestic species and into humans? How do we develop more humane methods of animal population control? Dr. Leonis from PAHO will be talking about the translation of such work from developed to developing countries on a regional basis. And Dr. Briggs will be addressing the issue of how do we maintain advocacy and dynamic partnerships for a disease that's been with us for millennia. And without further ado, we'll turn to our next speaker, Dr. Slate from USDA Wildlife Services. Thank you, Dr. Ruprecht, and good afternoon. Uh, my presentation will focus on rabies along the human-animal interface, uh, some of the key challenges we face in promising novel approaches uh, to enhance rabies control in dogs as well as wild carnivores. Well, Dr. Ruprecht uh, covered uh, many of these points to stress the impact of dog rabies on humans. I'd like to add that uh, here in the U.S., even though rabies was declared, uh, even though the U.S. was declared rabies free, here in the U.S. we have dog rabies still in, in, in the source of this rabies is in wildlife. 
These are not canine, true canine rabies virus variant cases, but were the result of virus spillover from raccoons, skunks, foxes, or other species that account for over 90% of the reported cases to CDC each year in the U.S. And such events draw attention to, the, to rabies transmission along the, the dog wildlife interface, which cannot be completely discounted when we're establishing effective dog rabies control programs. In 2007, it was estimated that 37.2% of, of U.S. households owned one, an average of 1.7 dogs, putting the U.S. population at 72 million dogs. And a, two, and a 2001 estimate of the global dog population was put at 400 million dogs. Now, that's a lot of dogs. Only recently have free-roaming dogs begun to be extensively studied from an ecological perspective. The structure and the dynamics of this component of the overall dog population is not well understood, nor are estimates widely available for these, the, the relative population size of these uh, three roaming dogs. The relative abundance of uh, roaming dogs in the United States is also unknown, but they are common on Native American lands where, where extremely low rabies vaccination rates are also suspected. The major dog rabies transmission pathways are shown here and illustrate that perpetuation of canine rabies is possible in specific wild carnivores. <coughs> The epizootic that occurred in coyotes, and, and as well as dogs and other wildlife in South Texas beginning in the 1980s, uh, as a result of spillo spillover of canine virus variant in dogs in Mexico, uh, represents a well-documented example of virus transmission along this, uh, along the uh, dog wildlife interface. Some of the key challenges we face uh, are achieving the 50 to 70 percent population, uh, population immunity uh, required to prevent dog-to-dog -dog transmission of rabies. The free-roaming dog segment of the population is difficult to vaccinate and may require novel approaches such as oral rabies vaccination to achieve meaningful herd immunity levels. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this later on. But, but one study uh, not yet published from Mexico suggests that herd immunity among dogs can be increased through oral rabies vaccination, but additional evaluation of effective ORV strategies is warranted. Rabies spillover from dogs into wild carnivores has had uh, impacts to rare species. It's led to perpetuation of canine variants in closely related species such as the coyote, as I just mentioned. Examples of the two major consequences of rabies transmission along the dog wildlife interface are that it, it may impact our ability to achieve both uh, rabies control in dogs and wild carnivores, uh, such as the virus spillover event that I just mentioned in Texas. It also may have profound impacts on, uh, on threatened, rare and threatened species. Uh, two of the world's most endangered wild carnivores the Ethiopian wolf and the African wild dog are, are threatened with either local extirpation or extinction as a result of spillover from rabies in dogs. In the U.S., the compendium of animal rabies prevention and control serves as a basis for conventional animal prevention and control programs throughout the United States and to facilitate standardization of procedures among jurisdictions. Uh, guidance in the compendium also extends to novel approaches uh, such as oral vaccination or contraception that may be incorporated in future dog rabies control programs where injectable vaccination is the central tactic. And for the remainder of my presentation, I'm going to focus on these novel approaches, oral rabies vaccination and contraception. A fundamental tenet of oral rabies vaccination is that it's applied to establish herd or population immunity it's not as a means of vaccinating individual animals. Oral rabies vaccination works by distributing vaccine-laden baits at prescribed densities uh, to establish herd immunity to prevent rabies transmission. Baiting typically occurs at the landscape scale by air, but may include distributing baits from ground vehicles or by walking. In Europe, Canada, and the U.S., the primary areas which are involved in oral rabies vaccination targeting wild carnivores over 42 million doses were distributed in 2009 alone. Programs, but in the U.S., oral rabies vaccine pro vaccination programs are directed at rabies control in the raccoon, gray fox, and coyote. As I mentioned earlier, 
Uh, the U.S. was declared canine rabies-free in 2007, but this goal would not likely have been possible without access to oral rabies vaccination to address spillover of canine virus into wild coyote populations, which are abundant in South Texas and are distributed throughout the United States. ORV was integrated into conventional rabies control programs that targeted dogs, and through strategic creation of ORV zones, first to prevent the northward spread, uh, rabies was eliminated from the U.S. in 2007, with the last documented case occurring in 2004 along the border near Laredo, Texas, and that was in a dog. Surveillance uh, is an enhanced uh, surveillance is an essential component of, of oral rabies vaccination programs and any effective rabies control program for that matter. The CDC developed direct rapid immunohistochemistry test through which an accurate diagnosis of rabies can be determined in less than one hour has led to a paradigm shift through which higher levels of enhanced surveillance are, are, are achieved to support oral rabies vaccination programs in the U.S. And now since field impl implementation of DRIT, or DRIT as it sometimes is called, in 2005, more than 40,000 samples have been, take, have been tested near ORV zones in the U.S. to assess program progress and to make adjustments in management. An evaluation of a handout model on the Navajo Nation in Chinle, Arizona, resulted in good bait acceptance among free-roaming dogs with about one-third dogs, one-third of the dogs uh, showing post-ORV virus, rabies virus neutralizing antibodies with the, with the use of Rabirol VRG as a vaccine. While additional research is warranted, the handout model has demonstrated potential as a complement to conventional methods to vaccinate a greater proportion of, do of a dog population within a community. Limiting dog reproduction uh, to enhance rabies control is a huge challenge. Surgery is a highly effective option, but it's time consuming and difficult to apply on a large scale. The injectable contraceptive esterosol may be available as an option in some areas, but its use is limited to males. The immunocontraceptive uh, vaccine Gonicon has experimentally been shown to be effective in several species, but is currently only registered for use in deer in the U.S. But given that this vaccine has contraceptive effects in males, in both males and females, it holds promise for reducing dog fecundity. Long-range oral delivery of this immunocontraceptive would be ideal to contracept free-roaming dogs. Recognizing that rabies has no political boundaries, a North American Rabies Management Plan was signed in 2008. It's actually signed on this stage uh, during the Rabies in the Americas Conference in 2008. Now, this plan provides a continental framework for collaboration among the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and the Navajo Nation to advance the state of science for rabies uh, surveillance and control programs. It has been a springboard for the collaboration, collaborative research on Gonicon in captive dogs in Mexico that I just mentioned. Uh, and it, it, as, a do, as dog rabies, as well as dog rabies initiatives referenced earlier on the Navajo Nation, and in surveillance control and, rabi and research initiatives between Canada and the U.S. on raccoon rabies. This plan represents a functional model of One Health that could be adapted to other regions where interjurisdictional or international collaboration is essential to achieve rabies control objectives. To conclude, uh, preventing rabies transmission to humans through their long-standing bond with dogs represents a challenge we must overcome to reduce the, the impact this ancient disease still has on humans in the 21st century. Advances in novel approaches such as oral vaccination would allow us to more comprehensively address rabies control and elimination where free-roaming dogs and wild carnivores play a key role in virus dynamics. Advances in contraceptive methods will be critical so that dog population control may be for, more fully integrated into, into a rabies, dog rabies control programs. And clearly an overarching goal is to work toward methods that enhance cost effectiveness so that they may be practical for application through programs designed to reach the developing world where rabies still takes its greatest toll. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to our next speaker, Dr. Leonis. Buenas tardes to everybody here in the internet and to the dog. I am regional advisor of zoonosis in Pajo, WHO. I'm not a tango dancer. 
<laughs> as she wants me to be. Uh, and I will talk about the approach to rabies elimination in Latin America. Sorry. Uh, PAHO is the regional office of WHO in the Americas and has 36 member states fighting against rabies and for health with headquarters at Washington DC and on the right the Latin America and Caribbean PAHO subregions are shown in the map. I will address political decisions and mandates for rabies elimination, epidemiological trends, remaining challenges, and the strategy PAHO member states are following for the elimination of rabies in Latin America. Main political mandates and international agreements for the elimination of rabies in Latin America are the program for rabies elimination launched in 1983, fostering national plans in all PAHO member countries. Then we have PAHO Directing Council in 2008, urging the elimination of human rabies transmitted by dogs by 2012, next year. Then we have country by country follow-up given by REDIPRA. REDIPRA is the network of rabies national directors of PAHO member states with relevant partners and is scientifically backed by CDC. National plans are very simple and are based on surveillance of rabies and rabies exposures, timely prophylaxis, and veterinary vaccination schemes. Because of the feasibility of these three simple interventions and because of the tragic nature of rabies, PAHO member countries consider the prevention and elimination of human rabies an ethical commitment. For example, healthcare to person exposed to rabies is a basi basic human right which is guaranteed without cause by all PAHO member states to all the inhabitants of the Americas. As you can see in the chart, the epidemiological trend in our hemisphere is one of the most successful in, in the WHO regions toward rabies elimination. From 1970 to 2009, there were more than 7,000 human cases with an estimated 60% transmitted by dogs. As you can see, the regional program has been effective in reducing the incidence of human and dog rabies. There were more than 300 human cases per year when the regional program was launched in 1983. In 2009, the number of human cases of rabies and rabid dogs diminishes significantly, but there still were 19 cases in 2009. 11 were transmitted by dogs. Regarding specifically to human rabies transmitted by dogs, from 2000 to 2009, there were 239 human cases. The number of cases peaked, as you see, in 2001 and is declining in all the subregions, reaching 11 cases in 2009. This map was produced by Redipra, identifies in yellow countries and zones that certified interruption of circulation of rabies among dogs are areas of low risk. In light blue, zones with no cases of dog rabies but with pending certification. And in red, areas with sustained circulation of rabies among dogs called of high risk of human rabies. Dog transmitted rabies is a consequence of poor development and, and inequity by itself. But PAHO member countries can prove to the world that interventions for dog rabies elimination are achievable even in developing countries with scarce economic resources. As you can see, for example, cases in Nicaragua, Peru, many, many countries with scarce resources have succeeded in the elimination of dog rabies. Redipra, the network of national directors, I mentioned it before, recommended very simple corrective actions to each country to achieve zero cases of rabies transmitted by dogs by the year 2012, vis-a-vis -vis four main remaining challenges. In six countries, dog vaccination coverage was not achieved due to insufficient provision of vaccines, causing human death. Patients beaten by rabid dogs received no proper post exposure prophylaxis in health centers in Guatemala, Argentina, 
and the Dominican Republic. Due to lack of local coordination for mass dog vaccination campaign, dog rabies persisted in Guatemala and zones of Mexico, Venezuela, and Brazil. <coughs> and also, dog rabies was a transboundary health hazard in several country borders as seen in the map, requiring better coordination between countries. Well, too many numbers here, but uh, rabies transmitted by wild species is a particular condition of the Americas and also a major remaining challenge. 462 cases of human rabies were classified by reservoir species either through clinic or through CDC monoclonal antibodies in 2000 to 2009. As said before, 239 were caused by dogs. But you can see that 149 were caused by vampire bats, mainly in the rainforest of the North and South America. Other transmitters were non-hematophagous bats, cats, livestock, and wild carnivora. So Latin America is unique regarding rabies due to the presence of vampire bats and the risk of incidental transmissions of rabies by any species of bats, for example, through domestic cats and livestock. Also, Latin America and the Caribbean share with other regions of the world the threat of rabies spillover from, uh, to human or dogs from wild carnivora. So the main elements for, of the strategy for tackling the remaining challenges include advocacy to avoid relaxation of controls when no human cases are reported, manage urban environments in relation to stray dogs and migrations, prevent circulation of rabies among dogs and wild carnivora, and tackling the challenge of prophylaxis in remote areas with no access to health services. To achieve the dream of an hemisphere without human rabies, PAHO member states are reinforcing the leadership of the health sector with stronger partnerships, taking advantage of the model set by the Global Alliance for Rabies Control. And new approaches are needed to tackle the remaining challenges under one health concept. Oral vaccination schemes for all free roaming, free roaming carnivora, in addition to traditional dog vaccination when applicable. Capacity to detect new variants of the virus via diagnostic surveillance based on CDC monoclonal antibodies to differentiate dog rabies variants from rabies caused by other species in every country worldwide as a matter of international public health interest. Promotion of animal control and welfare and protection of people in remote areas with better prophylactic schemes. All this should and can be applied in all the countries with all levels of development as was demonstrated by PAHO member states with the technical tools developed by CDC and other scientific partners to reach sustainable achievements in public health. And now, our next speaker, Debbie Briggs. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Briggs, the director of the Global Alliance for Rabies Control. And I'm going to talk today about the role of advocacy and partnerships and how that can be very effective at a community level. So you've heard from my colleagues about the tools that we have and the fact that we can actually prevent human rabies. So therefore, one begins to wonder, why do people still die of rabies? And I can tell you from my trips that what I see is one of the main reasons is because of a lack of awareness on all levels, including responsible pet ownership and the need to vaccinate pets to where to get post-exposure prophylaxis, and even primary wound care. Rabies immune globulin and vaccines are often not available in poor resourced countries, or people have to travel long distances in order to get them. And this is a picture of a family who had to travel a very long way in Tanzania to find vaccine. And when they got there, they only have enough money to vaccinate one of the five children that was exposed to a dog, and so they have to make a decision. And this is reality. So 
I want to talk about how global partnerships and efforts can actually help to change the situation. About five years ago, rabies experts from around the world got together to see what we could actually do. And in 2007, we launched the first World Rabies Day, which is a focal point for increasing awareness. The same year, the Global Alliance for Rabies Control, a 501c3, was launched. And then the following year, we established the Partners for Rabies Prevention, which is an informal group of public and private partnerships, people that come together in order to solve problems, find solutions. And through these organizations, we have created a global e-communications network and a bank of free educational material. And we have actually, in the last three years, launched and successfully eliminated canine rabies in Bohol, Philippines. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So what have we done since the first World Rabies Day, which incidentally is on September 28th? Well, what we've seen is 135 countries that has, have actually reported holding events. We've had more than 150 schools of veterinary medicine and colleges of, of medical uh, education that have been involved in hosted events. We have had more than 300,000 people coming to our website to download educational material. And we have heard from over 200 countries about what they're doing through efforts that we've put on the web to help control rabies. And here is a picture of actually the graph of what you can see how the awareness has increased over the years. And the peaks are actually in September, the, the month of World Rabies Day. And you can see people coming to our site to download information. What we've seen is re regarding an impact is more than 1,200 reported events, and we know there are more than that when we travel around and speak to colleagues. We know that almost 5 million animals have been vaccinated on World Rabies Day, and we know that we've sent educational messages to over 150 million people across the world. We also know that through World Rabies Day, new animal vaccination programs have been established in endemic countries, We've seen reinvigorated educational programs. We've established global networks. And we also, World Rabies Day is now listed on the UN Globally Observed Days. Prior to World Rabies Day, for example, in a country like Mozambique, dogs were not vaccinated because the people thought that by vaccinating dogs, they were no longer good watchdogs. There was a lack of support from the government, and the basic educational materials were not available. After World Rabies Day, what we've seen in Mozambique is an, a partnership between the veterinary clinics and Maputo Veterinary University. We've seen multiple dog vaccination clinics being held throughout the country, and the national government is now funding vaccination programs on uh, World Rabies Day. And we've seen increased educational awareness of the locals and even a construction of an animal record database. Our communications outwork, outreach begins by people getting on the web, logging onto our site, putting in the information that they need, and then Peter Costa, our global communications expert, will answer them, send them what they need. They take that material and they are the ones that actually use it to educate the people in their own communities. We continually evaluate our programs, and what we've seen as a result of World Rabies Day, we, we conducted a survey this year, and of the 213 surveys that were returned in four languages, we saw about 96% of the people that said rabies education is actually saving lives. We saw 90% of the people that said World Rabies Day is making a difference, and 95% of the people said that they would host another World Rabies Day event. So, World Rabies Day is fantastic, but what more could we do? When we put together this informal group called the Partners for Rabies Prevention, we wanted to really sit together and work as a group. And the Partners for Rabies Prevention includes all of the international health organizations. So we come together to discuss common strategies, look at needs, develop timetables and deliverables, and actually make a difference. And the Global Alliance sits as the Secretariat. What have we done? The first thing we did was to develop a roadmap that everybody agreed upon, and that was in 2008. And then in 2009 and 2010, we developed the first ever blueprint for canine rabies elimination and human rabies prevention. 
And our next step, what we're doing now, is to reevaluate the global burden of rabies. Now, if we take just a minute to look at the blueprint, which you can see a picture of the website here, it is the first time that all of the information has been put together in one place. So it's freely accessible online. It has an example of ongoing programs in various countries, links to the important documents. It has information on cost, planning, funding, etc. And it's actually a new concept. So by putting everything together that's accessible, people have less time to have to find what they need, and they don't have to pay for it. And it's aimed at countries where rabies is present and countries where rabies is reintroduced. Now, looking from the, actually writing the blueprint to implementation, what has it done? Well, it was launched about six months ago, and we've already seen workshops in, in Istanbul and in India. And I can tell you that India is using the blueprint to actually, as a reference for human rabies prevention. In West Africa, the blueprint is being used to improve communications and institute dog vaccination programs. And we are now working with the EU on four new languages for the blueprint, and we hope to have that online in the future. Our program in the Philippines began actually with a, a publication that was, was authored by da Dr. Dan Fishbein from the CDC and Dr. Dr. Betsy Miranda from the Philippines. And they looked at what would happen if you actually eliminated uh, dog rabies in the Philippines. And they reported that if dog rabies was eliminated in the Philippines, it would save $2.5 million a year and that money would be, the cost of the program would actually be recuperated in four to 11 years. So therefore, we thought we could actually do a pilot project in the Philippines, and we began with Bohol. And what has happened? Well, I can tell you that this program has just been amazing. We've gone from 140 people in that particular province, of which 1.4 million people live, to 15,000 people that are involved in rabies control. We've vaccinated 70% of the dogs. We've increased the clinics and the training. And of all of the school children that are enrolled in education uh, in the schools in the Bohol, Philippines, we've educated all of them. And that is 182,000 people. And last year, CDC actually conducted a training on the DRIT. So the result is, in the last two years, there have been no rabies deaths in Bohol, Philippines. And prior to that, there are at least 10 cases a year. And it's, Bohol is currently being evaluated by the Ministry of Health to see if it can be declared rabies-free. What have we learned from all of this? Well, we've learned that we can actually prevent rabies, but we need support from multiple sectors. We need public-private partnerships. We know now that communication networks are very powerful. Look at World Rabies Day. And last year, we had our first global webinar, and we had 34 countries participating, over 2,000 participants were able to ask each other questions. We know that we have many tools in place, including vaccines, reduced regiments, the DRIT, websites, etc. But we still have lots of challenges. One of the most important things we need to do is to invest in tools for dog population management, and you've heard that already from my colleagues. We need shorter pre-exposure vaccination regiments. As Dr. Leonez said, in, in places like the Amazon, the indigenous people cannot come and sit for a month to have the vaccination regimen given to them. We need improved global and national surveillance. We need to reassess the global burden so that we can actually look at tools and how that, uh, at models and how that can actually save money in the long run. We need novel strategies and methods, most importantly, to ensure sustainability where programs have actually been successful. And with that, I thank you on behalf of all of the speakers. We'd like to open it up to questions. If there's anyone on Envision. Not seeing anybody. Any questions from the audience? If you have a microphone, please raise your hand. Otherwise, please approach the microphone. Dr. Velasco. 
Hi, um, this is Dr. Velasquez from uh, National Center for uh, Sonoric Infectious Emerging. Sonoric Emerging Infectious Diseases <laughs> is large. <laughs> it, this question is for Dr. Dennis Slate. Dr. Slate, you just mentioned during your talk that uh, rabies was historically introduced into wildlife, particularly in southern U.S., um, from uh, dogs into coyotes and some other species. Later, you mentioned that apparently there is now a current problem in, in Texas where the uh, gray fox bear now it's apparently introduced in, in the dog population. So my question is, what is uh, the real risk of the uh, now adapted uh, variant in wildlife to return into the dog population? And what is the role of um, dog control or dog population management to achieve uh, the elimination or the burden? Uh, thank you, Andreas. Yes, there have, there have been cases of gray fox uh, variant spillover into dogs. Fortunately, through the ORV efforts that have occurred there in, in West Texas, there's not been any a continuation of that trend. There have been no cases since May of, uh, I believe it's 2009. So, you know, they're, they're both candidate. Obviously, Eurocyon as a genus is a little more distant than Canis as a coyote. So, uh, evolutionarily, I would hate to speculate. I'd maybe turn that to Dr. Ruprecht, and uh, perhaps he'd like to speculate on that. That's a very interesting question. I think the, the bigger take home picture is that not only has red fox rabies through ORV been controlled and eliminated in some places, and we've broken transmission of that particular variant, most importantly here in the United States, we've prevented the progression of raccoon rabies from east to west. This ORV demonstration, particularly in Texas, demonstrates again that we're driving these variants to extirpation. And as you're aware, some of these rabies viruses no longer exist except on our freezers. So I think this is another demonstration of intersectoral cooperation par excellence based upon what we understand about the ecology of the disease and then using useful, humane, and innovative techniques to further control and drive some of these viruses to extinction. So to answer your question in a nutshell, the ability to bring it back will be driven to zero if, in fact, that variant no longer exists in nature. Yes, at the microphone. Um, John Iskander, OADS. Uh, thank you all. Presentations. I'm wondering if the speakers um, alluded to the need for uh, simplified either pre or, or post exposure re regimens uh, for, uh, for uh, humans. Uh, are there any uh, sort of technological breakthroughs like that um, on the horizon? I know recently we've gone to a, a reduced uh, dosage, uh, a reduced number of dosages, but are there, are there any? much sort of larger breakthroughs to get it down to where we are with most vaccines where it's a, a, a single dose or a, a, smaller, a smaller number? Thanks. That's an excellent question. Um, quick answer, yes, from some of the SBRR-funded research initiatives. For example, here at CDC, we're looking towards needless delivery of biologics, which in theory could be even as, if not more effective than intradermal delivery, which is a very cost-effective measure. And in addition, many researchers are looking at the possibility of replication deficient rabies virus vaccines. And so, for example, in some of the areas that Dr. Leonis mentioned, such as in Amazonia, this would provide the opportunity to give, in theory, perhaps even a single dose of a future biologic if, in fact, this is proven out in the lab and through limited clinical trials. And perhaps Dr. Briggs or Leonis have other comments they'd like to make about breakthroughs? I think it's a, a really good question. One of the problems is the cost of doing clinical trials. But what we have seen in countries where it's very expensive, the vaccine is very expensive. It, for example, in one country I know of in Asia, the average number of doses that a, a patient would receive is three, and we don't see deaths. So we know that we can actually reduce the numbers. It's just doing the clinical trials. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Dr. Tack with um, EIS, EIS officer at the Pox Virus and Rabies Branch. I have a question about the role of cats here in the U.S. with the risk of rabies. Um, feral cat populations in general tend to be a big problem in most um, 
states, I don't believe, even require vaccination necessarily of cats in general or necessarily all cats. So what is the, what's the risk and maybe some other alternative controls? Because just like with getting some of the roaming dog populations, trying to catch a feral cat and vaccinate it is um, quite a safety hazard. Thank you. That's an excellent point. And in fact, cats have replaced dogs as the major domestic species of concern in the United States. There's been a lot of activity, as you're probably aware, about the management of feral cat populations through ABC, um, such as vaccination, release, sterility control, et cetera. Similarly, cats are one of those animals that, for whatever reason, we ignore. We think that a happy cat necessarily has to be an outdoor cat, which then brings up issues of responsible pet ownership. Obviously, there's similarities between responsible parenting and responsible pet ownership as well. We don't let our, well, we're not supposed to let our children go unsupervised. It's a similar situation in regards to our pets. So I think one of the major things that we can do and hopefully all agree on is improve education through responsible pet ownership. And I know Dr. Slate might have something to say in terms of the contraceptive possibilities for GNRH-like um, vaccines for cats. Well, I heard you mention bobcats. Let me let me speak to that first. There is in South uh, West Texas where we're conducting oral rabies vaccination, in in uh, collaboration with the uh, Texas State Department of Health Services. There's some suspicion, given the number of uh, bobcats in that area, that bobcats might serve as a as a reservoir. Uh, they are the next species most frequently reported, if I'm not uh, correct, right? Well, possibilities, uh, uh, I mean, Gonacon may have some possibilities as uh, as it works in both males and females. I would um, put you in touch with Dr. Lowell Miller at our National Wildlife Research Center to look look further into those possibilities. Um, this worked in several species uh, that has been tested in so far with one shot multiple year uh, efficacy. So. Uh, I would put you in touch with Dr. Miller and we'll be happy to do that. But, but the bobcat question was one of, could it be a reservoir? Perhaps, I mean, it's certainly an interesting question. It might be faculty be a, a reservoir under certain high density situations in a certain geography with, a, with say, gray fox variant, variant present. Nobody knows the answer to that, but we have done some uh, ecological studies on habitat partitioning and, and uh, contact radio telemetry that will be interesting to see the final results on uh, there. So there could be some benefits from focus of research on bobcats as well as domestic cats for the issue of the Felidae as a whole. Luckily, barring this last potential example, luckily no cats domestic or wild anywhere in the world are recognized as reservoirs. And so one of the primary ways, at least from the rabies standpoint, is to focus on the reservoirs and rabies cases in cats would then be driven to extinction and, of course, vaccination because of the issues related to bats and bat-catching cats. I would add from an oral vaccination standpoint, we're pretty fortunate in that case because it would be very difficult to bait cats because they are truly sort of chase predators. It would be hard to, hard to bait them with the, with the type of baits that we're using now at least. Dr. Monroe? Uh, thanks, Steve Monroe, Division of High Consequence Pathogens and Pathology. I'm not sure who best could answer this, but my question has to do with the sustainability issue. And certainly, we've seen with the polio eradication efforts that as the program goes on and trying to achieve the last few percent, that um, in countries where resources are limited, there's the, the tendency to, to divert resources from a program that seems to be not important anymore to other things that are important. So. Are there approaches from the um, education side, whatever, on, uh, to maintain the political will to keep the program going and sustained over time, even when you do achieve uh, elimination of, of human cases? I'd like to answer that. And, and just looking at the Bohol Philippines project, we actually looked at sustainability and how could we maintain that. And what they did in the Philippines was actually to charge a small amount to register dogs and that smaller fee goes right back into the program. And, and so it is sustainable when the funding that we have been able to uh, um, acquire with the Swiss uh, um, Foundation disappears, then it's going to be sustainable through the money that they raise. And also, education-wise, what was done in the Philippines was actually to take education and put it into the curriculum 
So rabies was put into math and science and reading and just integrated into it that way and it, it appears that it's extremely successful. Um, Jan Nicholson, OID. I noticed that, um, Chuck, you talked about the confirmatory test is a DFA. I'm wondering if there are any plans to look at a molecular test. Thanks very much. Um, yes, there's a variety of molecular tests. The limitation is that things like antigen-based, be they the direct fluorescent antibody test or the DRIT, by and large, we can get a rapid answer in about an hour very cost effectively. And similarly, unless one is thinking about some of the advanced diagnostics that are used for certain other agents, the utility of even light-based microscopy is it's an anatomic pathologic diagnosis as opposed to just a light or a band. When we've looked at some of the more recent point of care devices, they've not had the sensitivity and specificity that we'd like to see. Now they could potentially be useful for some gross surveillance where there's nothing at all. But at least in terms of the quality, the CLIA standards that we've recently risen to, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything in current development that's going to replace either the sensitivity or the specificity of the gold standard, be it the direct fluorescent antibody test or the DRIT test that you can use in the field and don't even need electricity for right now. So it's a, it's a much needed goal, but one that we haven't been able to realize as of yet. Yes, ma'am. Abigail Tumpy, Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. Um, question for Dr. Slate. I've heard you present half a dozen times over the last several years, and I'm still just completely fascinated that we drop vaccines out of airplanes. I think Pasteur would be so proud. Um, but my question is, in regards to, um, to doing some of the ORV campaigns that you've done, what sort of communications do you do in advance to semi-residential areas before vaccine drop occurs? Yes, we, we work with the local entity and use our legislative and public affairs, and we've even worked with CDC to get the message out uh, to let folks know that baits are going to be falling from the air and to not be uh, handling them, and if their dog has one, to not try to take it out of its mouth because that's the most common way that a human is exposed to the vaccine. So we have a pretty concerted uh, communications plan um, to, to get the message out. We even have um, media days when uh, the bait drops begin, bring the media in, get some television coverage and things of that nature. So it's, a, it's kind of a diverse uh, uh, you know, communications plan to get the message out. It may be a, a sign of success that, in fact, people are losing interest in the media attention of it because it's becoming almost as happenstance as vaccinating your dog or your child. So perhaps that's a demonstration of success that it's no longer considered unusual or bizarre for a concept that was born at CDC 40 years ago. Hi, thank, uh, Jennifer McQuiston in NC Easy ID, I think is our current name. Um, very nice presentation, and I was really interested in the information you presented on both injectable and potential oral contraception for dogs. And given that dog population control can have numerous public health impacts, and rightly driven by rabies, but also rickettsial diseases by ticks, injuries due to dog bites, all sorts of things are impacted by population control. I'm curious if you have an opinion about how far out we are from having a licensed oral or injectable contraceptive for dogs in the United States. Well, I think that's uh, obviously ideal and visionary. I think we're, we're a ways away from that. Um, I mean, as I mentioned in my presentation, the work that's going on in Mexico, I think, is a, is a very important piece of work to determine if, in fact, the new formulation of Gonacon would be acceptable to use in mass injectable campaigns. And Dr. Ru here at the CDC has done some early work at the oral delivery, uh, the development of oral delivery, and Dr. Miller at our National Life Research Center has uh, had sent some considerations. But I think we're a ways down the road before oral delivery. And of course, in wildlife, that will raise, uh, would raise many questions. I think we'd be talking about oral delivery in dogs. Uh, for wildlife, uh, use of Gonacon would be injectable, if at all, because of the it's difficult to, to integrate that kind of thing into wildlife populations from a political perspective. 
Thank you all very much for attending, participating, and, and thanks to our speakers. May I ask you to give them one more round of applause? And we'll see you same time, same place in five weeks. Thank you.